Hi, and welcome to Temple Street. I'm Brittany Elschlager. I'm Karina Bolster. And I'm Ryan O'Connor. On today's show, we'll take a look at the recent Hollywood movie shot in the Boston area and learn how the Suffolk women's soccer team is doing this season. We'll also see what people think about casinos coming to Massachusetts and talk to a world-renowned playwright and critic, Robert Bernstein. We'll then end, as always, with Critics' Corner, and this time a review of the fall television season. But first, the news. In downtown Boston, Target may be the store to finally fill the spot once occupied by Filene's. Suffolk reporters Chloe Newland and Ryan O'Connor have the story. Referred to as the Filene's Crater, the void left in Boston's downtown crossing has been filled with nothing but disappointment and aggravation for Bostonians. What began as a promising idea for a $700 million 39-story skyscraper, the location has spent the past five years like most of its fellow community members, waiting. Yet according to recent reports in the press, the anticipation may just in fact be reaching its end. In early September, the Boston Herald reported that Target is interested in filling the gap on Washington Street and is making inquiries to buy the building. This news brought at once a glimmer of hope for shoppers and Boston residents and some concerns about a large corporation such as Target overshadowing the local businesses. CEX manager Greg Carlson believes bright things are in his store's future as a result. The only way I can see that even affecting us is just by bringing more business into the area. Uh, which of course could always create more traffic uh, for us and that could really give us some kind of positive push. With its circulation of shoppers and dollars dropping annually downtown, experts say a large company capable of stirring the pot, such as Target, is necessary for the area's rebirth. President of the Downtown Boston Business Improvement District, Rosemary Sansone, explains. We need to broaden the depth of our retail experience and a Target, I think, would be, um, from what I understand, uh, from people that have called us uh, would be very uh, positively uh, accepted in the area. I think people are really looking for a broader shopping experience which Target can provide. As one of the largest employers in the U.S., supporters say Target would benefit the Boston area beyond being a magnet for consumers through its new employment opportunities. Yet, some Bostonians seem to have a difficult time picturing the retail giant landing on one of the hub's landmark historic buildings. I think it would be perfect. I only know one target and it's in the middle of Dorchester, so I think another target would be great. Right. Will it be a good thing? I don't know. I don't it yeah, it just kind of doesn't fit in. It really doesn't. I mean, if they can keep it looking kind of uh, historical, you know, keep the turn not to lose too much of the personality, I think it would be really great. Another target just means more products from China, which means that we go into more debt and we keep giving them money, so I would say no. According to a Target spokesperson, the venture is currently being examined, but no specific details can be given. Whether it ends up being Target or not, the general consensus is that something needs to fill the hole left in the heart of historic downtown Boston. Ryan O'Connor, Temple Street News. Thank you, Ryan and Chloe. We can't wait to see if Target will be coming our way. Over the last decade, tax breaks in Massachusetts have attracted more film producers and directors to shoot in and around the city of Boston. Film producers, film production has not only sparked the growth of revenue in the city of Boston, but also a rise in tourism and general increase in local business as well. Reporters Moss Lynch and Jeff McHugh have the story. The city of Boston, historic, scenic, and now the backdrop for hit blockbuster movies. Over 500 movies, TV shows, and documentaries have been shot in Boston over the last few decades. Among the most memorable movies include The Departed, Fever Pitch, Gone Baby Gone, and Grown Ups. Carolyn Pickman, a local casting director and owner of CP Casting, has cast the talent for renowned films such as Goodwill Hunting. She says these productions change the opportunities for local talent significantly. Boston is an incredibly beautiful city to shoot in. Uh, there is enormous diversity as far as what the city looks like. Uh, what it has to offer and um, the people that are in this city uh, go a long way to making up an extraordinarily vibrant uh, feeling and look for the, for the purposes of movies. Pickman and her CP casting company have benefited greatly from these films, so much that their work comes to them. I've been fortunate enough to be able to hire people in my business to stay on board with the company and we haven't ventured out of the New England area, you know. There really hasn't been a need to, because the work has come in, you know, nice and steadily for us. Massachusetts is giving significant tax breaks to movies filming in Boston, which is supported by State Representative Donald Wong, 
who says the growing film industry benefits the economy of the city in many ways. People love to see places that they know, and I think this will be great for the economy of uh, Massachusetts, and it will bring tourism in, because tourism spends three times what the average person spends. Due to filming in various tourist attractions in Boston, officials state that tourism rates have risen to 26.2 million people over the 2010 to 2011 year, which is an 11% increase since 2009. I think it's going to be a plus. Um, it's going to bring money into the community by just having people come. And when people see the film and recognize the areas of Boston, people are going to come just to see it. For some, such as local comedian and actor Steve Sweeney, these movies provided enough work to create a more solid base for his career. Go Before there was this boom in films, I did a number of films here. I did Celtic Pride, I did a movie called The Vig, I did a movie called Next Stop Wonderland, and then through those I, I become, became very good friends with the Fairley brothers who are from the area. Thanks to these opportunities, Sweeney says he has been able to travel around the country and further network with producers and directors in the film industry, turning his gigs into a more stable career. We never realized when we grow up in Boston, if you go to LA you realize what a huge industry it is. You can see that in Universal Pictures and all that. And if it becomes a viable part of the community, then people will actually start thinking of it in terms of a career. Suffolk student and inspiring actor Christian Roberts says the growing movie industry in Boston has greatly benefited him, preparing him for future involvement in an acting career. You meet people, you know how to work on a set, and then um, you know just play it, take it from there, and. When I graduate in nine months, I'm going to feel like I have a solid plate. Experts predict that the film industry in Boston is going to further grow, bringing more revenue and tourism, thus providing even more benefits and opportunities for the city. I'll see you again, this side or the other. Moss Lynch, Temple Street News. If filming in the hub continues to increase and progress over the next few years, Boston may indeed become the new Hollywood. As we approach the middle of the semester, one sports team is also halfway through their season. Temple Street reporters Kayla Vesey and Jeffrey Miller took to the field with the so Suffolk women's soccer team to find out what makes this team special and what they think of the growing popularity of the sport. Come back! Oh, can you believe this? Abby, this summer's 2011 World Cup hype seems to have once again put soccer on the map, just as the memorable 1999 team did. And though not all players will have the opportunity to turn their passion into a career, as Suffolk coach Ernst Cleofat says, soccer is a universal game. Um, let's say I speak, you know, one language and the next person speak his own language and the next one, you know, you have 11 or 25 different players, you know, on the team and let's say we all speak different language, you know, different languages. But guess what? We may not be able to communicate with each other in our own language, but we communicate well on the field. And that's what's so great about the game. I love this game. <laughs> Suffolk University did not establish a soccer program until 2007, but this young squad already has plenty of accomplishments to be proud of. The Lady Rams are 6-6 six and six, coming off of a season after going 13-4-1 and, and ranking 5th in the nation in scoring. They have started off the season slow, but are gaining momentum with four straight victories. Coach Cleofat guides his players with hard work and dedication, on and off the field, insisting on the importance of maintaining their grades. And this year, the team was rewarded for their academic success by the National Soccer Coaches Association of America. But uh, I have a lot of respect for them, um, you know, because they, uh, they have school, you know, work plus you know, games and practices, and uh, they, they are able to manage, uh, to manage that well. While the players have diverse academic backgrounds, from the business school to the sciences to communications, when they step on the fields, they all have the same goal. Senior captains Leslie Hayden and Christina Michael are eager to fill leadership roles for their younger teammates, who the captains say already have great chemistry with the rest of the team. I think struggling together on the field, um, created kind of like a bond. We realized that 
we were playing for each other and um, winning and losing together. And as we got better, we started to have some success, and that kind of added to the chemistry as well. Even though these young Division Three competitors have had their ups and downs, Hayden, who has scored nine goals in their last two games, says they are not an opponent to be taken lightly. It's fun being the underdog and proving something to other teams, and he did that quite well. Though the team looks to improve certain areas, they have nothing but high hopes for this year, as well as the development of their program in the future. You know, if, if our team can make national headlines and even win the NCAA Division Three national championships, I think that would be very exciting for not, not just the program, but the school. For Temple Street, I'm Kayla Vesey. You know, I was at that game that we just saw, and they actually managed to pull out a win within the last five minutes of the game. That's so great. It's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, sophomore Monica Wolf actually made that shot from 25 yards out, and that's it's pretty impressive for a sophomore, like taking taking the leadership role mm -hmm. and everything like that. So that's great. Go Rams! For more information or to view their upcoming schedule, go to go to go .com. The casino bill is big and controversial topic. In, within Massachusetts right now, and it has been passed by the House. Morgan Weedman and Brianna Pitts hit the streets of Boston to get the opinions of the local residents. What's next? So are you guys for or against casinos? Uh, for. For casinos, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for casinos. And what is your reason for that? Uh, gambling's fun. It's good entertainment. Uh, I think I'm against it. Um, a lot of people have problems with gambling. I think that promotes it even more than we already have with the scratch tickets already. Um, you know, the numbers games. I think that's enough. I'm all for it. And why are you for them? Uh, it's going to create some jobs for us, and it's a, yeah, it's a good time. A nice, safe place to have a good time for a weekend. Well, my feeling about it is, is it's the way of the state taking money from the poor people and it does not do any good in the uh, economic uh, scheme of things. People in Massachusetts need money too. We shouldn't have to go out, you know, far into another state to, you know, use our money and spend it. So closer to home is always the best. I'd rather be able to stay home and not be that close and to have to travel a long distance. Doing casino is like involved more of, um, you know, people who are gonna involve more of like doing crazy stuff, basically. There's no way to control it. That's the problem. When people get out of control with their gambling, and uh, like I said, it's a habit. It's just a poor personal choice and a poor, poor personal uh, set of values, I think. But I went to one outside Portland a couple of times, uh, and it was more like an entertainment location. It wasn't uh, just a casino. I never gambled there, but I went there a couple of times. Definitely gave them a decent amount of my money. I would say four. They're a lot of fun. Make a lot of money. I enjoy my time, cheap drinks, cheap fun, go casino. So girls, none of you are old enough to go gambling yet, but you've heard about casinos. Are you guys for them, against them? How do you feel? Um, well, I'm kind of for them because I think it creates jobs and then more people will have work. Do you have an opinion? Um, I'm against them because people get in trouble and they're just not good. Sorry. And your reason for? Uh, taxes, jobs, and... Making an eerie better looking. More business. Uh, I'm for casinos. Yeah, I think that it you know, could generate a lot of revenue for certain areas. I agree we definitely need jobs, more jobs. Um, I mean, there's got to be another way, though. It, it depends on how you do it. There's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. Best thing in the world for the state of Massachusetts. We need jobs here. This is the most important thing with the state of Massachusetts now. And the gambling casino will, will be a ni nice uprising for the people around the Massachusetts and Boston area particularly. It seems the majority of people are for casinos. Karina, what are your thoughts? You know, I'm, I'm for them. They're going to provide some employment opportunities for us, and they're going to create revenue, and that's definitely what we need during these economic times. So, yeah. I'm not personally for them, but I do see how it could go either way. Right, right. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back after a short break with Suffolk Distinguished Visiting Scholar Robert Brewstein. And our critic, Ryan O'Connor, will be dishing out his take on the new fall television shows. 
the magical thing about using energy wisely is that anyone can do it. Turn off lights. Use energy saving light bulbs. And turn off computers and game systems when not in use. Make a change and we can really fly. Grab a grown up and go online to energy.gov slash kids. <clears throat> Let me drive. I'm not buzzed. No, I only had a few. It's my car. <laughs> I told you to slow down. My dad is going to kill me. Have you been drinking? I smell alcohol. Step out of the car, please. You're under arrest for operating under the influence. What was steady constant breath? If you're under 21 and get caught with a trace of alcohol in your blood, you risk being arrested, fined, and losing your license for six months to a year. A little can cost you a lot. Fresh off the run of his first play at Suffolk's Modern Theatre, a 21st century adaptation of Shakespeare, distinct theater playwright Robert Brustein has joined us here in the studio for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our very own Chloe Newland. Og, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio and taking the time out of your schedule to be here. Uh, you're an accomplished playwright, critic, producer, educator, so why don't we start at the beginning? Actor, don't forget actor. Excuse me, actor as <laughs> well. You're, you're every the whole package. Um, <laughs> so why don't we start at the beginning? What prompted you to get involved in theater? A very simple technical problem. I couldn't pronounce the letter L. And my parents, um, thinking I was going to have some speech problem all my life, sent me to what was then called elocution school, which I would have called evocution school. And... Um, this was just a nom de plume for a drama school. They were afraid to call anything a drama school in those days because people didn't want to think their children were going to grow up and become actors. Anyway, uh, they put me in some plays. I remember playing Little Boy Blue, and I remember playing a pirate chief uh, who was making fair maidens walk the plank <laughs> with a mustache and my arms crossed like this, and I still have a picture of it. And I got hooked on acting. And um, my parents also sent me to summer camp where I would play roles. I remember playing one of the three little girls from school in the Mikado. <laughs> and um, I just uh, very much enjoyed being on stage. And uh, that uh, enjoyment uh, exists to this very day. That's great. Um, I was intrigued by one of your quotes. Uh, you said, theater going is a communal act, but movie going is a solitary one. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, when I go to the movies, I don't want anyone around me. I want to have my seat with two or three seats empty so I can really enter uh, a private experience. But if you go to the theater and there are two or three seats empty, you think there's something wrong with the play. You know, it's not <laughs> filling up. It's not very good. And the fact is you respond to what's going on on stage as a community. I've always thought that the audience was the final actor in the play, and that until that actor entered the play, which was on opening night or the first preview, uh, the actors didn't really know what it was. Uh, and uh, they kind of defined it for the actors and then became one of the actors. Um, so being a founder of the Yale and American Repertory Theater at Harvard, mm -hmm. what was your vision while establishing these fantastic institutes, the arts? Well, the Yale Repertory Theater was founded in, 19, in 1966. Uh, and it, w it was founded because I had agreed to become dean of the Yale School of Drama, but I could not imagine training or having a training program that was not aimed for a purpose. And I remember when I was a student, none of us knew what we were being trained for. Were we being trained for Broadway? Were we being trained for, uh, uh, for, um, for theater, uh, community theater? Were we being trained for the movies? We didn't know. 
And therefore, the training was very inchoate, very undefined. So uh, I persuaded the authorities to let me raise money and start a, a company. And uh, there were three reasons for it. Number one was to know what you were training for, that this was the aesthetic of the, of the training program. Number two, that actors in the training program could work with professionals side by side. Because I always felt that the best work done by young actors was always done when they were competing with professionals, not when they were just competing with their own uh, equals. And thirdly, it was a place for the people who had gone through the drama school to enter and become members of the company. Uh, and the same idea was behind the American Repertory Theater, although it took us five years before we could get a school started, because Harvard didn't even have a course for credit in theater for undergraduates, much less a school of the arts. And I, uh, it took me five years to persuade them and to find the right word uh, to call it uh, before I could... Uh, bring students in to do pretty much what they had done at the Yale School of Drama. The right word, by the way, was institute. Institute. Harvard had institutes. They had a Bunting Institute, the Radcliffe Institute, Kennedy Institute. But schools of art, they didn't have. So uh, they, they agreed to let me start this institute on two provisos. One, that I never asked them for any money. And two, that uh, uh, we never give them a, a degree. They were given a Harvard certificate. Mm. But uh, with the help of Rob Orchard, who's now running Arts Emerson, and who had made connections in Russia, they spent three months in Moscow in their two years and uh, worked with Russian teachers, and they do get an MFA from the Moscow Art Theater School. So you also are a recipient of many prestigious awards, uh, mm. such as the George Polk Award of Journalism, a member of both the American Academy of the Arts and Letters, the Theater Hall of Fame, was receiving the 2010 National Medal of Arts from President Barack Obama just another trophy to add to no, the cause no, of the no, show. Oh, my God, that was a high moment in my life, actually. I'm a great admirer of President Obama. And um, and I, I look on him as someone who knows the arts and has actually read the books uh, that he was awarding and rewarding. And um, that this humanistic uh, element in his character, which makes him somewhat Hamlet-like and somewhat indecisive at times, also makes him um, extremely compassionate and extremely attractive and congenial. And I, um, I was really exalted to receive a medal at his hands. He is a fantastic man. He is an extraordinary man. Um, what brought you to the Boston area and Suffolk University? I came here because at the time I came, in 1979, there was very little theater going on here outside of the commercial theater and Broadway tryouts. But there was the nonprofit movement was virtually dead. There were some very extraordinary theaters, but they didn't survive. Uh, the Theater Company of Boston, David Wheeler's company, the Charles Street Playhouse, the Massachusetts Repertory Company, which, by the way, was Group 20, Theater on the Green, uh, its effort to start a theater in, uh, in, in Boston. None of them survived, and I was warned not to come here, but there wasn't a theater audience here. <clears throat> and against all warnings, I did come. And I discovered there was a theater audience, and a very good one, um, and a very literate and lively one, and contentious, you know. They didn't uh, take everything lying down. They liked to argue with you and debate what you did, and that was all very exciting and vital and helpful to the kind of work we were doing. Okay. Um, so do you have any advice for students who are attempting to succeed in this industry and mm -hmm. are not as lucky to have a class with you? Well, that's very sweet of you, but... There's some very, very good teachers around, and I do advise them, these students, to, uh, to find a teacher, to go to a training program. You don't get it just through, you know, sitting in Schwab's drugstore. You don't get anywhere that way, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you get picked up. Uh, occasionally, but um, it really was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure talking to you. And uh, thanks so much for coming in. My pleasure, thank you. Back to you guys. Thank you, Chloe. I really enjoyed this conversation. What a contribution Mr. Brewstein is to our university. Now we hand it over to Ryan for our Critics Corner and his take on two of television's biggest shows this season and their new recent lineup changes. Ryan? Thank you, Brittany. Over the past year, so many loyal fans have been anticipating the exits, entrances, and returns of some popular TV stars. 
With hit shows losing their stars, many are left wondering whether the shows will continue to bring viewers or be cancelled before conversation about them even reaches the water cooler. And speaking of the water cooler, one show that is much talked about for losing its star to bigger and better opportunities is NBC's The Office. Michael Scott, played by Steve Carell, is a character that most find impossible to emulate, never mind outdo. Carell's comedic timing and ability to make situations so uncomfortable you either had to cl cover your eyes and make random noises to block them out, or simply change the channel, made Scott a character that will go down in TV history as one of the best and most original. Seven seasons, six Golden Globe nominations, six Emmy nominations, one win. Still baffles me to this day. Yet how can The Office possibly go on without its valiant leader? Yes, we all love Jim, Pam, Dwight, and the rest of Dunder Mifflin's employees, the most perfectly cast show of all time, if you ask me. But I think it's safe to say that without Carell Scott, The Office would not even be considered amongst the ranks of NBC's past heavyweights. To find its replacement, though, producers and execs did what any office would do. They held interviews for the position. And boy, was there a turnout. Ray Romano, James Spader, Will Arnett, Ricky Gervais, and Jim Carrey all made appearances in this past season's finale in the hopes of securing the title of regional manager of Dunder Mifflin Scranton Branch. Following the episode, the internet exploded with fans' takes on who it should be, and the response was more or less unanimous. In the end, Spader was chosen. How many people know who James Spader is before hitting up Google or Wikipedia? That's a different story. But producers believed he would bring new life to the show by creating a character that was Scott's complete opposite. Brilliant, all about business, and utterly terrifying. As a diehard fan of the show, I doubt Spader can fill Carell's giant shoes, but that remains to be seen. At least Carell left on his own terms, though, right? Well, speaking of strong-minded men with giant shoes, let's talk about the infamous Charlie Sheen. Two and a Half Men, the show the New York Times called the biggest hit comedy of the past decade, they're yeah, right, was so close it was scary to an eight-season biography of Sheen's life, co-starring Ducky from Pretty in Pink and that adorable kid from The Rookie. In my opinion, Two and a Half Men during the Warlocks years was a series on repeat mode. You've seen one episode, you've seen them all. Now, that may not be a perfect representation of the show as I obviously haven't seen all the episodes starring Sheen, but having fallen ill a few times and been caltridden, I have been forced by my parents to watch my fair share. Which can be extremely awkward by the way when you realize your parents are laughing at downright dirty jokes you'd hope they wouldn't understand and then look at each other and continue laughing and nodding hysterically as if you're not even there. It's nauseating. Anyway, my point is that if Two and a Half Men is in fact the biggest comedy series of the past 10 years, I completely lose my faith in humanity especially in Americans, which also proves that the executives over at CBS are equally as intelligently challenged. They're upset with the man who made the show what it is today because he went around drinking, doing drugs, sleeping with hookers, and showing absolutely no regard at all for his well-being, when the character they have created for him does all those things at the same time, and doing those things on screen made him hilarious, and a millionaire many times over taking home $1.8 million per episode? And to make sure we don't confuse the two, they even named the character Charlie? <laughs> Come on. If anything, I gotta hand it to him because Charlie Sheen quite possibly may have invented the best acting method of all time. He lived it. He was Robert Downey Jr. in Tropic Thunder. That is dedication. But the machine and the show parted ways, and the reason that 70s show was a hit, Ashton Kutcher, stepped in. And what do you know? For the past month, Kutcher has been dealing with marital problems as he was photographed leaving a club with a woman who went on to call herself his mistress. Anyone else see a recurring curse related to this show? The bottom line is, sometimes you just have to accept that it's over when it's over. And forcing things, especially in comedy in these cases, in my opinion is not going to work. I hope The Office learns this quickly and goes away peacefully before it joins the library of cancelled NBC shows, while Two and a Half Men becomes the laughing stock of next year's Emmys, hosted by The Office creator Ricky Gervais. So Ron, you're a big fan of The Office, oh, huh? I love it. I don't know if I could watch The Office without Carell on it. Uh, it's a big void, but we'll see how Spader does. Ashton Kutcher's actually doing a pretty damn you good know, job. I haven't I seen that one with uh, Two and a Half Men with a minute, but I don't know. I guess I'll have to try it out. Definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ryan, for that critique, and um, we look forward to seeing how these shows pan out. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Temple Street. I'm Brittany Elschlager. I'm Karina Bolster. And I'm Ryan O'Connor. See you next time. Bye. <laughs> so whatever.